Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the Friday afternoon session of AMA Junior Camp 2021. I am the education specialist, Kyle Thede, and here to help me with our final guest speaker of the week is education director, Kyle Jarris. Hey, man. Thanks so much for having me back on. And uh, boy, what a bittersweet moment. Like, you know, I'm super excited to talk to Red and uh, to find out what he's been doing and, and how he uses model aviation. But boy, I, I'm almost equally sad that that this week is over, that, you know, we've just had so much fun with all these projects, all these interviews and conversations. I've learned a lot. I, I think everyone here has learned a lot. And uh, I, I kind of almost don't want it to end. <laughs> Um, well, the fun doesn't have to end. Um, you still have the models and the projects that we've been working on all week, and we designed those so that you can keep working with those and you can keep modifying them and keep learning from them well after your campus over. So, um, and of course, all of this is going to be made on demand. So if you want to come back and revisit um, Junior Camp 2021, you are always welcome to do that and share it with other people who that um, you think might be interested in it because like we learned yesterday, model aviation is a community and it's all about sharing your passion with other people around you. And uh, I can't think I can't think of a better way to finish off the week than with our final guest speaker. I've been excited to talk to this guy all week, Mr. Red Jensen. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here. It's so good to see you, man. Good to be seen. <laughs> Well, why don't you go ahead and uh, we'll get started. And can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got interested in model aviation? Sure. Um, my name is Red Jensen and I run the subscale flight research lab for NASA Armstrong, where we basically use uh, various forms of model aircraft to do flight research with. Uh, some can be as simple as a you know radio controlled model. Most are more sophisticated than that. But if you were to visit my shop, you would see things that are absolutely familiar to anybody who flies radio controlled model airplanes. We use the same servos, motors, things like that. Control systems are obviously a little more advanced and, and some of the things we do with them are very advanced, but the basic package uh, looks very familiar to most folks. Um, I've been a lifelong modeler. My dad was a model airplane guy before me and um, I soloed an RC model uh, when I was six years old. So 42 plus years ago, 43 years ago, and I've uh, been hooked ever since. And I have model aviation to absolutely thank for my career at NASA without question. Well, it looks like you've got quite a few models back there behind you in your, uh, in your studio there. <laughs> yeah, this is my garage. Um, I'm out here working in the shop today. So I took some time out to chat with you folks, which I'm really excited about. But yeah, these are just some of the, some of the aircraft that I, fly. Um, I'm an avid scratch builder, an avid designer. I also, you know, grab and fly ARFs all the time. Um, one of my favorite aircraft is, you know, the, this one, the Timber. Um, one of the best fantastic all around airplanes ever designed, in my opinion. It's, it's so versatile and I just have a blast with it. So that's, that's my go-to in the front yard when I need a, a few minutes of flight time. But I like everything from indoor free flight to turbine jets to slope soaring and, you know, everything in between. Well, the nice thing about that timber, too, is you can really fly it however you're feeling that day. If you want to really get crazy and, uh, you know, do some hang it from the prop or whatever, you could you could potentially accomplish that. If you want to just laze around and fly some circles, that's fine, too. Like, it really is versatile. It, it really is. And, and uh, I really enjoy the short field takeoff, the stall type stuff. And you know, flying places where you wouldn't normally fly. And I see a lot of folks, um, you know, online or I'll meet different people that have a timber and they leave the leading edge slats off. And, and I always ask them why. And, you know, invariably they, they think it hurts inverted performance, which it does, but uh, it makes up for it, in my opinion, in the slow flight capability. So put the slats on, guys. It's a lot of fun. You have other planes to do 3D with. Yeah, that's the greatest part about model aviation is you can have lots of different styles of plane that can do a lot of different things. Totally, yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, kind of dealing with uh, our project from this morning, I, I showed you this a little bit earlier, that we worked on um, some model hovercraft. And I it's my understanding that you have a certain style of model aircraft that is very, very similar to this. Yeah, so I've played with hovercraft quite a bit, um, along with what's called a wig or a wing and ground effect. But for the hovercraft, um, you know, typically they're a balloon and some sort of flat piece of material, cardboard or a CD or something like that. And they work pretty well. But my, um, you know, I was looking for better performance, like everything that I do. 
And I discovered that if you use um, packing foam that you find in like an Ikea furniture package or something like that, the really thin, maybe quarter, half inch thick plate foam, the stuff that you would throw away, it crumbles very, very easily. Um, if you take the bottom side of that, you can sand out kind of a cavity. And what that leaves is a thin edge of a skirt all the way around. And then you power it the same way with the balloon from underneath. And it rides on a cushion of air much better than, um, you know, something flat that just lets the air escape in whatever direction. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually create little thrust jets in the back by drilling holes into that cavity and it will propel it forward. So I've had a lot of fun with those with my kids. And um, the other fun one to do that's, you know, really easy to build is, is a, a wig or a wing and ground effect. And this is a concept really developed by mostly the Soviets um, for full scale aircraft where they they fly an aircraft that's very large in ground effect where it rides in a cushion of air on the ground and or over the water, I'm sorry. And you can transport things that are very heavy over great distances for relatively low, uh, low power. So this video we're looking at right here is actually what gave me the inspiration to try to build just a, a glider. Um, these are non-powered. He's just scooting these across the ground and they, they ride on this little wow. cushion of air and uh incredible lots of fun very cheap to build and you know if you build one of those and show it off people will be blown away because you don't see them anywhere um i i go to the reno air races every year um, i'm a participant up there on a few couple of race teams and i built a bunch of these and took them with me in uh, to the 19 races and we got rained out and winded out one day and, and we had like 50 of these things going in the big hangar at reno so there's all these race pilots you know playing with these toy airplanes, which is a ton of fun. But doing experiments like this really taught me more about aerodynamic concepts and uh, how to trim things and how to make things work than really any book does. I mean, you need the book foundation, absolutely. But the practical stuff to me is uh, much more uh, of value. Well, that would definitely so be a, a great party trick. <laughs> Bring that out to no the kidding. next uh, place you're going to be. And uh amaze everybody and they're they're pretty simple to build you could probably find plans online you can and the really the only thing you really need to worry about is sealing the trailing edge surface to the floor or the ground so you can see that the wing sort of touches the ground and all the areas in the front of it is open so what happens is, is that it captures uh air from moving forward underneath the wing and, and traps a bubble underneath the wing and it really works basically the same as a hovercraft except for using a a fan to, pr to promote lift with a hovercraft you're using the forward motion of the vehicle. So yeah, tons of fun. And you can't really design them wrong. As long as you get the center of gravity in the right place and the wing is sealed, they'll, they'll fly. And that was something we were talking about with our campers earlier this week, that there's all kinds of different uh, principles and all kinds of different scientific ideas behind how things fly. And this is definitely a, a different way of going about it than other ways that we've experimented with this week. So um, for the junior camp viewers, if the hovercraft was your favorite project this week, if this is the one that you're really excited about, then it sounds like there's a great way to follow up with it. Yeah, it's a good it's a good hack, and uh, you know doesn't cost much to do, and they're they're tons of fun. You mentioned kind of your um, your interest in full scale aviation, model aviation, how it obviously led into your career. Talk about that yeah. a little bit more, and you even mentioned Reno Air Races, how you go there and enjoy it. What's that big thing behind you too? So there's several questions there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a big one. Um, so, you know, as a kid growing up with model airplanes, I, I was, you know, fascinated by flight. I still am. I, I love to read. I love to learn and, and especially explore weird and new concepts to just sort of understand how things work. So, you know, that, that veracity for flight really is what led me to NASA. I never intended to work for NASA. It wasn't a dream. I didn't, you know, didn't plan the path there. It, it really just sort of happened. And the way that it happened is um, prior to this, I worked for another company that built UAVs and uh, fairly large, couple hundred pounds. And I had owned a hobby shop at the time and their lead designer was a friend of mine who I flew sailplanes with and they were looking for a demonstration pilot. And I had, um, you know, been flying my whole life and he knew that I was a, a competent pilot with, with dear, weird and, and different type things. So he said, hey, would you be interested in doing a little bit of flying for us? And I'm like, yeah, of course I would. I'd love to do that. So I did that. And uh, that turned into a full time job with them. I eventually got rid of the hobby shop and worked full time for the UAV company. And uh, during that time, I was there about 10 years total. 
uh, we would go to Edwards Air Force Base to rent the airspace to do some performance testing on our UAVs. So I got to know some of the folks there. And, um, you know, out of the blue, I got a phone call one day that about, hey, we have an opening here for, uh, you know, a UAV pilot and, and really somebody to run our whole subscale flight research lab. And are you interested? And I, I thought about it and I said, no, I'm not interested because <laughs> I, I loved my job. But, um, you know, persistence one out and eventually I made the move and it's fantastic. I, I couldn't be happier. I love it. Um, I've been into, you know, full scale aviation my whole life as well. My dad was a pilot and um, I grew up, you know, running around the airport and eventually earned my pilot's license and had lots of friends who flew different things. Um, I was very fortunate that my parents took me to the Reno air races uh, for the first time in 1979. And, uh, you know, we only lived about a four hour drive away, so it became an annual affair. And I've gone every year since uh, I've missed three along the way. And um, I'm currently uh, crew chief on a Formula One race team and I'm building a Formula One airplane of my own. Um, if I can, I can share my screen here and, and show you, I think, uh, what I'm doing here. So this is a. What's behind me is the, the plug or the master pattern for my full-scale Formula One aircraft design that I'm working on. So this will be a fully molded carbon fiber airplane. Um, I learned how to do composites and mold making and all that stuff thanks to model airplane. And this is, this is nothing more than a giant model airplane. Um, you know, all the aero is very similar. Um, you know, building the structure is it's very similar. The one piece of the puzzle that I was missing and why I didn't start on this years ago was because I'm not a structural engineer. So I didn't know how to build the plane strong enough that it wouldn't weigh, you know, 10,000 pounds and, and it wouldn't fold the wing up and, and kill me or somebody else. So, you know, that really held me back until I got to NASA and I found some people um, who were smarter than me that would help me design the structure and, and they did. So, this is where I'm at. I've hand built the molds for the fuselage and the tail. The wing mold is being machined uh, by a very good friend of mine named Eric Chase. Um, the wing is an uh, incredibly important part of, you know, the heart of any airplane and, and particularly in a racing airplane. So uh, my good friend, Steve Clausen uh, designed the airfoils, which you can see there in the lower right. So these are a completely custom set of blended airfoils and, and helped me with the wing plan form and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's sort of my, um, you know, my, my swan song, my dream is to race it at Reno. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. Real quick, Red, could you enlarge that on your screen so we can bring it up on ours? Oh, Make sure. How do I do that? Just so we can see it. How's that? Was that working? There we go. Perfect. That's it. Oh, that's that looks so cool. Yeah. That is so one cool looking airplane. Thank you. Um, the color scheme is inspired by um, the Gulf Porsche racers. Uh, I love that color scheme and a gentleman named Mirko Picarari, who's a, a, a fairly well-known um, aircraft designer and, you know, paint scheme designer. He designs all kinds of stuff um, in Italy, agreed to do the scheme for me. So I have him to thank for that. And if any of you folks have any of the uh, Spectrum radios like the IX-20 or the IX-12, Mirko designed those, those radios. So he's fairly well known in the model airplane industry. Um, he also designed a, the 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 GB R3, which is a fantasy scale model of a plane that never was. That sort of made it big in the RC world. So um, anyway, yeah, that's been a lot of fun. So that's my current my current crazy project. Well, that's definitely a cool project. I have to ask, why the V-shaped tail? Is there a particular reason that that's a good design for a racer, or is that just a personal touch? Or there is it's a little um, bit unusual. Yeah, yeah, you don't see too many V-tail uh, full-scale aircraft. You see them fairly often in high-performance soaring aircraft and some pylon racing aircraft. But what it comes down to, in my opinion, is intersection drag. So anytime you have two surfaces that come together, the air that flows in, in between that intersection is a higher drag area than normal. So by going with a V-tail, one, you eliminate one of the four intersections. So you've only got three intersections now. And the angles are obtuse instead of being, you know, 90 or even acute in some cases. So it's a it's a low drag thing. Very interesting. So this plane is, you know, no compromises. It's not really a sport plane. It'll it'll get sport flown, but it's not a cross-country machine or, you know, there's no lights on board. There's 
uh, room in it just for me, barely. And honestly, not even the current me. It's going to have to be a future me to fit inside it. So, um, you know, no suspension in the landing gear. Um, it's really made to just do one thing, and that's to race at Reno. So, so if you if I if I can ask, or if you can share, what kind of power plant are you going to put in there? Yeah. So the class is defined by um, rules that say you must use a spec power plant. So it's a Continental O two hundred or a, or a C ninety a Lycoming. And uh, so they're really tightly controlled on the on the power plant. You might put out 130, maybe 140 horsepower and full race trim, but that's capable of taking the top race planes to you know over 250 miles an hour average on the course and over 300 miles an hour in a straight line in some cases. So uh, 500 pound minimum weight and 66 square feet minimum wing area. So they're quite small airplanes and uh, weight is the enemy. So that's why I chose to do it all composite. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing. That's really cool. Now, is there a place that people can go to, to learn more or to be a part of that journey? Yeah. So this is really, you guys are kind of the first people to see this out in the public. I have not really shown this off. So um, I will be unveiling it on my YouTube channel uh, probably in about a week. And then, you know, you'll see it all over social media. So if you're on Facebook or Instagram, you'll be able to see that. Uh, send me a friend request. I'd appreciate a like and a subscribe for sure. Uh, but I do have a Facebook page now that chronicles the build up to this point, but it's private. There's like 30 members or something like that, all my close friends. Um, that'll be opening that up soon to the public as well. So you can follow me there and um, yeah, reach out if you have a question. I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Good deal. This is an well, AMA Junior Camp exclusive sneak peek. I've seen uh, like with with everything from auto stuff to, to the aircraft thing to, you know, it's, it's a whole mixed bag, but it's all fun. It's, a, it's really enjoyable. So I'll plug your channel too, man. It's, it's a lot of enjoyment. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what you were alluding to is I'm building or restoring a car with my son right now. He's, he's 12 and convinced me that he needs a first car. So that didn't take much arm twisting on his part. I'm a, I'm a hot rod nerd, you know, uh, motorhead for sure. But yeah, check it out. And uh, right now, the, the latest stuff is car stuff, but there's going to be a lot of airplane stuff coming up, too. Um, I'm a small time kit maker as well. I design and, and produce some kits. So there's some stuff on there about some of my kits. And there's a little bit of work stuff on there, too. So you can see a little bit of uh, NASA stuff. I don't put too much on there because, um, well, for obvious reasons, you know, it's got to go through our public affairs folks. But um, yeah, there's there's some stuff there and there'll be a lot more in the future. Very cool. And I think we actually had a, a comment or asking a question about that. You've seen, we, there's obviously a lot of really cool things that you're uh, keeping busy with in your free time. Um, but yeah. as long as we're not, as long as we're not like, you know, asking about government secrets or anything, can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do for your job? Certainly. So NASA um, is all about flight research and particularly at Edwards Air Force Base at Armstrong Flight Research Center, we, we like to joke, we're the first A in NASA, you know, National Air and Space Administration. So we do um, aircraft testing. We do a little bit of space stuff, but not a whole lot. Primarily, it's airborne stuff. So my job is um, really designing, building, and flying research prototype aircraft. So my lab is what we call a technology incubator, uh, where somebody has an idea or a concept, and they'll come to us, and we'll either design and build a complete airframe and go test their aerodynamic concept, which is the case with the Prandtl flying wing aircraft, or maybe they have a payload or a crew concept or some software they want to try out or something like that. You know, we test anything and everything. And the reason for that is because model aircraft or UAS, whatever you want to call them, provide an amazing amount of research uh, that is relative to a full scale aircraft for a very minimal investment in both time, money, and resources. And also, we do the crazy stuff uh, so that if it hits the ground, you know, you're not you're not hurting anybody. Whereas if you had this crazy idea that you wanted to try something to get a person to pilot that thing, you know, you're talking decades worth of, of research and time to even get to that point. And who knows, technology could have moved on by then. So we decide, um, you know, when we decide to do something, you can get results in a matter of weeks or months or, you know, a year or two. So programs are relatively short lived, usually six months to two years. And, um, you know, then we move on and, and try something else. You mentioned the Prandtl wing. That's such a cool project. It really is. And I, I know that we listened to uh, Al Bowers and yourself as well on a presentation yeah. that actually ran 
um, at an expo and uh, a lot of great information there. They can go online and uh, see some more information about that. I think it was, oh, there it is. Modelaircraft.org forward slash yeah. expo top 10. You made the top 10 list, man. Awesome. That's great. Well, the, the Prandtl, um, the Prandtl wing is really a, an overarching theory that, that encompasses a, a series of probably 30 or 40 different research aircraft. They all, they all are very similar, but they're all, um, you know, different iterations on a, a certain thing. And really what it's looking at is why birds don't have vertical tails. You know, birds have been the model of flight for humans for, you know, eons, hundreds of thousands of years. And we've looked at the skies and seen birds flying and not one bird has a vertical tail. And yet almost every single airplane that we see has a vertical tail uh, with the exception of a very few. And the few, you know, excluding Prandtl, that don't have vertical tails, um, you know, they usually are uh, generally regarded as unstable. Uh, for instance, like the B-2 stealth bomber has triple redundant computer system to fly it. And without that, it's not flyable. Whereas our solution here um, is really aerodynamic and it's mechanical. In other words, there's no um, computer on board. And there's no mechanical mixing or anything like that. It all has to do with the shape of the wing and how it flies. So basically, we're looking at why birds don't have vertical tails. And it turns out that this is a, a fairly efficient way to design a wing as well. Well, efficiency is huge. I mean, you don't have a fuselage to waste, you know, space, energy, you know, <laughs> the, the materials, the time involved. Like, you know, this is it's a pretty slick deal. That's absolutely true. And, um, you know, beyond that, if you just take two two equivalent wings and compare them, Typically, the Prandtl is a lower drag in an equivalent scenario. And the reason for that is because of the way it deals with tip vortices. Um, in a traditional wing, the load is carried in the shape of a quarter of an ellipse, right? So you have the highest lift in the center of the wing, and it tapes off to zero at the wing tip. And where it tapers off to zero at the wing tip, you've actually got a pretty high uh, pressure differential there. You've got a, a relatively high pressure on top and a relatively low pressure on the bottom. And when they mix together, that swirls and creates a vortex. Um, what the Prandtl wing does is it, by way of twisting the wing, and it's a static twist, it doesn't twist in flight, it's not part of the control, it moves that uh, stagnation point or that mixing point inward to about three quarters of the span. So you get this vortice, it still forms, but it's it's larger and it's looser, more loosely constrained and it's lower energy so that you don't get that big, big drag uh, penalty. Uh, one of the great benefits of that, though, is you get proverse yaw instead of adverse yaw. So the reason aircraft have vertical tails, which was invented by the Wright brothers, by the way, they discovered very early on that you need a vertical tail, uh, is to counter adverse yaw. So what happens is, is when you roll an aircraft with the ailerons, let's say you roll it to the right, uh, the right aileron goes up, left aileron goes down. While, while it rolls right, the downside aileron, because it's in higher pressure air, because of why the wing makes lift, drags the nose the wrong way. So it rolls right, and yaws left. That's called adverse yaw. Uh, in model aircraft, and, and in some cases in full-scale aircraft, the way you deal with that is something called differential. If you're a sailplane pilot, you know all about differential. But what you do is your upside aileron goes up way further than your downside aileron. So it's sometimes it's a ratio of two or three to one, something like that. So that's typically how we've dealt with adverse yaw for, for eons. Um, you know, Prandtl wing comes along and it has completely symmetrical control left and right. So there's no adverse yaw problem and it, it automatically coordinates the turns. Tracks right and, into it without any rudder, obviously it doesn't have one, but. That's right. So, and, and the reason it does that is because as you increase lift uh, with the downside aileron or increasing camber, you also reduce the drag, which is exactly opposite of how a normal wing works. So when you roll that left side, instead of dragging aft, gets pushed forward and it automatically coordinates the turns. And this is like the second, excuse me, or third flight ever of this vehicle right here. And uh, you can note an interesting phenomenon that we were talking about earlier, ground effect. Uh, in this flight, when the aircraft gets right low to the ground, it doesn't wanna, doesn't wanna come down. And uh, yeah, Lee's right that the <laughs> GoPro was a ton of drag in this. Um, uh, there is a little funny story, you know, we take interns um, from around the country every year at NASA, and and the interns were present for this flight here, and uh, I confess I drug the landing out as far as possible because they have to go get it and bring <laughs> it back. So, you know, I could have set it down earlier, but I didn't. <laughs> well, that ground effect is really cool. You see it almost yeah. bounce right off that cushion and just keep going. It, it's really yeah, neat. And it, absolutely, it happens in full scale model aviation. It it just is what it is. 
It is, and and it's really pronounced in vehicles that are high efficiency. So sailplanes, long wingspans, you see that more because they are so efficient. So that little bit of bump in energy that that increases the L over D, you know, it tends to go further. Yeah, for sure. We've had some really great questions come through. Um, and, you know, obviously people love hearing about these stories, hearing from you, Red. Um, one of them was, uh, are you f from uh, Jack? What are you flying for work and for fun? Um, so if you want to share some of that. Sure. Um, for for fun, man, I like anything. Like I say, um, I was just, uh, this is a sad story. I, I built a new dynamic soaring aircraft and I, I took it out yesterday and destroyed it. So that <laughs> That one hurt a little bit. That was fairly expensive, too. It was a big molded airplane. But you know what happens? You know, uh, a moment of inattention cost me an airplane, but I'll build another one, whatever. Um, for work, I, I haven't been flying a whole lot for work for the past year because of the pandemic. I'm working from home. Uh, we do go in occasionally and fly here and there. Um, one of the aircraft we're supporting is called X-56, which uh, if you want to Google that, you can bring up some pictures of that. But it's a 500-pound twin turbine flying wing aircraft that we're researching flutter suppression with. So all aircraft, if they go fast enough, will flutter. And uh, flutter is incredibly destructive. It kills people and destroys airplanes. So we're researching a way to use a flight control system to delay the onset of flutter or even prevent it completely. And the reason you want to do that is because you can build a lighter weight wing, for instance. If it doesn't have to be structurally strong enough, to handle the flutter for whatever airspeed or mission you have. If you can use a control system, build a lighter weight wing, now you have a lighter, more efficient airplane, um, you know, all those sorts of things. So that's that's one that I've been working on. Um, we also are, yeah, there it is right there. Um, we're also flying a hybrid quad rotor research aircraft, which takes off like a, a giant quad rotor and then has a pusher motor on the back and it transitions into wing borne flight. It's called an HQ-90, and uh, we're doing see and avoid research with that. So it carries a radar on the nose, and it carries a set of acoustic sensors that can listen for other aircraft around it and echoes from buildings and things like that. And it's got a, a very, very sophisticated um, computer on board that runs a, a terrain database, so it can do ground collision avoidance and aircraft avoidance all in real time. So the idea is to be able to do all this without... Uh, any human intervention. So we're we're sort of paving the way for unmanned aircraft. Yeah, there's that's it right there. That's our HQ-90 uh, to pave the way for these aircraft to fly in the national airspace and, and keep everybody safe. Uh, it's no secret that that, you know, all these coffee places and, uh, you know, jungle selling places want to deliver packages and things right by by unmanned aircraft. So it, it's going to happen. Um, it's just a matter of when. So we're trying to do our part to make it safe. I think we're working on pulling up a video of that HQ-90. I'm very curious to know about, to see how, what you were describing, how it takes off like a quad rotor and transitions to vertical. Here we go. Yeah, this is from the manufacturer here. And I believe that's, uh, that was Kevin Garland there. He's a, he's a buddy of mine. Uh, anyway, um, so they start the engine on the ground. It's a, just a regular two-stroke um, desert aircraft. You know, you everybody knows what those are. And then it takes off uh, vertically, and the uh, the autopilot. It's kind of a neat, kind of an elegant solution how they did this. The autopilot does not know whether it's in horizontal or wingborne flight. It it runs all the controls all the time, and but there's a special little thing that that adds throttle for the pusher motor and then takes throttle away from the lift motors, and that's how it transitions. So. Uh, pretty neat because typically having two different gain sets or two different autopilot sets for the horizontal and the and the vertical flight is troublesome. And I think what they've done is a pretty elegant solution. So you can see it transitions uh, pretty nicely. I've got a quick question about it. That's for very you. cool. So you said that the HQ-90 uses uh, acoustics to sense other aircraft. That's right. Is it an active solution like sonar or is it a passive solution where it's just listening? Well, it, it, it's a sensor fusion is actually what they call it. So we're using radar, we're using a, a visual odometry setup and a, um, a stereo vision and a, along with a set of microphones. So it all gets blended together into a filter and wow. uses all of that data to you know present a real time solution. So the, the computer on board knows the capability of the aircraft. It knows how fast it's going, how much it weighs, its minimum turn radius, its maximum climb, all that kind of stuff. And then there's a buffer 
uh, that's programmed in. So let's just say, for instance, it needs 75 feet to, you know, to avoid an obstacle. Maybe the buffer is set at 85 or 100 feet or something like that. So it can, once it detects something, it can do a maneuver to avoid. Um, but the acoustic, you know, the acoustic thing works a lot like your, your eyeballs and the visual thing. You know, you can tell distance because you have two eyes. That's how you resolve distance when you want to grab something or you're flying a model airplane, you want to hit the middle of the runway and, you know, not the fence or whatever. Um, sound works the same way. So it's a time of flight between, you know, what the microphone picks up uh, from one microphone on one wingtip and one microphone on the other wingtip. It can triangulate, you know, exactly where it's the, the sound source is coming from, its relative bearing, its speed, all that kind of stuff um, to provide a, an avoidance solution. Oh, it looks like really uh, cool stuff to, to share, man. That it's it's always fun when I when I know that you're going to be jumping on because I'm going to learn so much. I'm going to see so much cool stuff. I'm going to hear about things I had no idea were were a part of uh, my world. And so it's it's enlightening. It's eye opening. Golly, this is fun. Let's keep. Going. It's a lot of fun, and, and the reason you know I was attracted to NASA, obviously, you know, because it's NASA. That's that's really not the reason I'm there. The reason I'm there is because they offered me a job that, in my mind, I thought would be different every day. Um, you know, in the previous job, while I loved it, uh, once we developed the product, you know, our job was to go use it. And, you know, you're not doing R&D stuff anymore. So with NASA, it's always somebody, you know, coming up with some idea and, hey, let's go try it. And I absolutely love that. I love the R&D. I love the trying stuff. I love the, you know, different every day. So that's really what attracted me to to NASA. Always new. Always something exciting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I got to, you know, there's some. Um, there's four other AMA, or three other AMA members that I work with too. Um, you know, Derek Abramson, Justin Hall, and Logan Shaw. They're all model airplane guys uh, that started out just like me doing model airplanes for fun, and eventually wound up, you know, working with me at NASA. And um, you know, we're incredibly busy. Not so much right now because we're at home, but you know, our lab is in very high demand uh, because of what. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but what you can do with a model airplane in a relatively quick timeline for low money, uh, you know, catches the eyes of researchers, right? Um, you know, once also, they learn that, hey, we, we can fly my idea, you know, in a couple of months from now, let's do it. Uh, so well, you, you, said know, earlier, you, know, you do the crazy stuff. That should be a T-shirt if it's not yet. Uh, <laughs> an unofficial yeah. probably. Let, let's keep yeah. it unofficial. Yeah, but, uh, there you go. One. You know, another program that we're working on is the next generation airliner. So what will the next generation airliner look like? And and right now they're sort of for, focusing on hybrid propulsion technology. So, um, you know, electric propulsors usually and distributed propulsion. So there's a lot of them along the wing. So you, you get um, different mass flow properties because if you have lots of small propellers instead of one giant one, you can blow the wing. So you have interesting sort of control uh, possibilities there. Um, onboard power generation, so like a heavy fuel turbine generator to, to run the electric motors. It sounds like it's kind of, you know, all this magic going from one form of energy to another, and it is a little bit, but you've got to research to figure out what works and what doesn't. And um, that, there's X-57. That's a great example of distributed propulsion. That aircraft is nearing its first flight. It will fly probably uh, summertime, um, although not in this configuration. It's just got two two motors the two wingtip motors are actually in the normal place so it will fly as an all-electric twin engine aircraft and then it will get its new wing with the distributed propulsion there and you can see that um, that wing looks smaller than normal and the way that you can get get away with that uh, particularly you think about landing and taking off right those are your slow speed regimes up and away we'd like to have less wing area and, and less wingspan because we can go fast but uh, with a distributed propulsion, you can blow the whole wing so you can have airflow that's actually higher than your indicated airspeed. So if you're flying at 80, you can have airspeed uh, over the wing at you know 120 or 150 or whatever it might be. So your flaps and, and things like that have a larger effect um, so that you can still have the performance of a similarly winged airplane, but with a much smaller wing. So it's things like that. Um, yeah, that's the current configuration. That's how it's going to fly uh, here real soon. 
That's so cool. And, and you know, it's so practical because in camp we talked about, you know, the Bernoulli principle, the Newton theories, you know, we talked about angle of attack and, and how wings work. Um, and, you know, what a great way to, to talk about the drag aspect of it. You know, let's make the wing smaller because we're blowing air across that whole surface and we can increase the throttle to get more uh, control over that airframe. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Well, so I'm here to tell you for the folks that might be considering, uh, you know, a career in aerospace or something like that. Um, what you've learned with a model airplane is exactly the same applied to full scale. Uh, you know, things change like Reynolds numbers and, and all that kind of stuff. But if you know what incidence is and dihedral and decollage and, you know, proper CG and aspect ratio and you know, all the kind of stuff that you learn as a, a model airplane guy that's kind of into it more than just, you know, for, for weekend type fun, absolutely applicable in the full scale world. And it's amazing to me that, um, you know, with my design background experience, all trial and error, right? Just trying to figure it out on my own. I, I read a bunch and things like that, but you got to build it and fly it. My design experience eclipses the entirety of NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center as far as aircraft design experience goes, because we don't design aircraft. We, we design an experiment or we design a upgrade or a, uh, you know, some way to reduce drag or something like that. So... You know, don't sell yourself short. Model airplanes are a huge, huge uh, benefit, and they're only becoming more and more relevant in the UAV world. So there are tons of job opportunities opening up, um, you know, in, in the UAV world. And if you're a solid, you know, RC guy that, that can really, you know, not only fly well, but you, you really know what you're doing, you can work anywhere in the world. And it's, it's no joke. So um, I'm living proof, right? <laughs> And we've been talking over the last couple of days with uh, some of our guest speakers about the amazing history of that model aviation has, but it sounds like it also has quite an amazing future ahead of it also. I mean, just some of the prototypes that you were showing, the HQ-90 and the, the Prandtl wing, I mean, you were talking about all the complex theories and ideas that go into the work behind those things, but when it's working, it looks like, it looks like magic, like that just that big gliding wing yeah. in an airplane taking straight off. It looks like it came out of a movie, like you CGI'd a special effect, <laughs> but it's all just, it's, it's all just the science and the engineering and learning how things work. Yeah. The, the funny thing. Possible. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing is, is, you know, the researcher researchers that I work with are incredibly smart people, right? I, I'm so fortunate to, um, you know, work with these people because I've learned an, an, an insane amount. Right. But, you know, any RC guy that watches that HQ-90 take off and fly that has, you know, programmed a quad or, you know, done PID, uh, they're like, oh, I could do that. And they're absolutely right. They could do that. So, you know, again, the possibilities are endless. And, um, you know, I didn't get to where I'm at because I'm some, you know, world class pilot or something like that. It, I, I've gotten to where I'm at because I've had the thirst to try to learn and the enthusiasm to follow through with it. And I always tell people that anybody can work at NASA. The only thing you have to have is the want and the desire to be there. And if that's, if that's what you want to do, come on board. We're looking for folks all the time. Um, uh, intern.nasa.gov, I believe, is the URL that will get you uh, if you're interested in being an intern. But we also are always advertising for, for folks as well. Now, I can't promise you a job in my lab um, that's a very unique skill set, right? And a very unique sort of situation. But uh, NASA in general is a is a fantastic place to work. Yeah, I keep sending Red my applications, and he, he at this point he doesn't even <laughs> respond anymore. Well, I don't even have a job right now, so I'm <laughs> like, you guys I'm might have back. better luck. You guys, and honestly, you know, we've had that conversation before, Red, where you're looking for people with modeling experience, that love of aviation, because. Yeah. You know, it's those people that you want to collaborate with. It's those people that come into it with that knowledge, right? Yep. Well, the funny thing is, is, um, you know, I, I have a hand in picking interns that come to my shop, right? Um, and, you know, invariably somebody will have a stack of resumes that they'll give me and they're like, well, this guy's, you know, uh, all A pluses and, and this girl, she's the, the president of this and, and done that. And I, I'm like, I don't honestly don't care about any of that. I, don't, I really don't care about your grades. If you're grades are good enough to make the application process, you're good enough for me. What I look for immediately is RC experience. Have you done any RC modeling? And, um, you know, even better if you're an experimenter. Um, but if you if you show me some somebody that's been in the RC business for, you know, three to five years, I'll show you somebody that 
knows some basic level of computer skills, maybe even some programming. They know how to solder. Uh, they know how to hook up basic electronics. They know how to you know wire a battery and charge a battery safely and all this kind of stuff that you, you can't teach that in school, right? It's an all, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a self-education that in some cases can, can take a lifetime. And uh, I have picked um, interns solely based on one or two lines in their resume with RC experience uh, over, you know, every honors college graduate or whatever, you know, that, that has a, a thick resume of all these accomplishments, which is fantastic. I'm not, I'm not diminishing that, but for my particular um, type of work that we do, RC is above everything else. So cool. It's so cool to see those videos, to see, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it. And, and to hear about how you're interacting and interfacing with those engineers and you're bringing that practical, you know, this is how it worked. This is what I learned experience while they're bringing that theory and saying, this is the mission we need to accomplish. And, and that's, that pairing is so cool. Yeah. And, and, uh, and cause that's the one. So, so my job primarily is a safety pilot. And what that means is, is that I have to keep everybody safe, right? No matter what happens with the vehicle or, or, or whatever I'm expected. If the air, if the aircraft is in any kind of control, um, I'm able to recover that aircraft and make sure that it, it it impacts safely somewhere or doesn't impact or whatever, but not hit anybody, right? So, you know, you can't teach that. If, if you don't have RC piloting experience already, and especially high performance stuff, heavy, fast, that kind of thing, right? That's that's really the, the weed out part for the pilot position, but all the other stuff's negotiable. I can teach somebody how to solder. I can teach somebody how to charge a battery or cover a wing or put a servo in. That's all you know, that's all low hanging fruit. I can't teach somebody how to fly. And beyond the, the flying part is safe operations. So we very much run our flight department like any other full scale flight department would. Um, you know, there, there's currency and recency checks. We all have to have medicals. There's there's checklists. There's, um, you know, all these requirements that you have to do. So it's not just like, hey, go turn on, go fly it. You know, it's, it's much, much more involved than that. Um, and, and some people would say that's that's probably a lot more limiting and boring. And unfortunately, that's true. Um, because we don't fly every day, you know, we might fly if we're lucky once a month, something like that. Well, but I mean, the preparation it safety code too. you know, it's so important to do things the right way to do it safely to have that knowledge um, of your own skill set, even so yep. that you know, like, hey, this is getting beyond me. I'm calling Red up. I'm going to make him fly this thing. You know, <laughs> that that's the well, kind of thing. Well, it goes beyond that. And that, you know, I like to I like the fact that the more I'm there, the more people trust me and they give us more leeway. So, you know, we have our own chunk of restricted airspace. We're at one on air, we're on an air force base, you know, where there's F 18s and F 22s and F 35s all flying around us, you know? Um, and we're able to, you know, do this research in such a way that it becomes more efficient. So, you know, in years past, it, it can be, months or years to go fly something. And, and now we have the capability since with us four guys, um, just tell us what you want to do. We'll, we'll integrate it and you can be there when we fly it, but we're going to handle the whole operation. And we're going to give you back the data that you want. And that's really what it's all about. So, um, you know, the center has, has provided a, a great amount of trust in myself and, and the three other guys that I work with for us to be able to go do that. And now uh, we can advocate on our own behalf. Like, Hey, there's this thing we want to try. And, you know, there, there's some funding that can become available or whatever to, to do that. So uh, that's been really cool. Well, it sounds like it's a lot of really cool things going on with what you're working on. And they and the people that you work with there sound like they're very lucky to be a part of it. And I'm lucky to have them, honestly. I needed help. So I, I was able to fortunately find three good people. And, um, yeah, it's fantastic. Now, I do want to switch gears here for just a second, if I can. Um, we do have someone in the comments who is very curious about something you mentioned earlier. Speaking of being a world-class pilot, um, can you explain a I little bit about that. how? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure you did. Yeah. Well, now but, what? Um, but um, we had someone in the comments who was curious a little bit earlier about um, the the Formula One racing that you do. Can you sure. uh, explain a little bit about how that works and what all goes into that experience? Sure. I'm assuming you're meaning the full scale Formula One hmm. racing. Um, I believe so. so. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, closed circuit air racing that only happens currently in one place in the world, and that's in Reno, Nevada, uh, every September. Um, although this year there is a second race happening in San Angelo or San Angelo, Texas, um, 
the weekend of Halloween, 30th and 31st. Um, that'll be a Formula One only race. But there are six different classes of racing. And there's a course laid out in the desert that ranges from about three miles in diameter to about uh, eight miles in diameter, depending on class. And up to eight airplanes at one time race in a circle around around pylons. And um, it's incredibly exhilarating. Um, it had a profound effect on me from my earliest memories. I, you know, race planes were set in the hook as deep as you want to go. Um, that's on board sport class right there. That's Andrew Finley. Uh, flying in a, a Lance Air. He's got a lap record of over 400 miles an hour in a oh, wow. basically a home-built airplane. Um, Using a production engine and all that? Yep. Wow. Well, yeah, it started as a production engine. It's, it's started, been it's you know, highly there, modified. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Heavily but modified. They, they, yeah, they're, the classes are Formula One, which are um, what I'm building. And then there is the biplane class, which are like pit specials and things like that. And then T6 class, which are, is a one design class, so the, the T6 um, Texan or the SNJ Harvard World War II trainers, they're, they're a very tightly controlled class, very, very uh, tight racing. And then there's uh, the sport class, uh, Unlimited's what you see going by there, which are really my favorite. They're World War II fighters um, that can go you know over 500 miles an hour on the course. And then lastly, the Jets, which are a relatively new class. They've been there maybe 20 years or so. Um, the dominant aircraft type is an L-39, which is a Czechoslovakian uh, trainer jet. And uh, yeah, it's it's absolutely fantastic. We, we didn't have any races last year because of the pandemic. Um, that's only the second time the races have been canceled. The first time was in 2001 when we had the terrorist attacks um, that shut us down. But it's been going on uh, continuously for over 50 years. So, so you're building your aircraft. It's right behind you. You're working on it. You've yep. done the design. You're doing the implementation. Uh, what year are you hoping to have it at the track? So, it, you know, I'm building it essentially by myself. I have an amazing uh, a group of friends who, who help um, almost all virtually. Um, Arch Admison did some CAD design work for me. Steve Clausen, who I believe is here in the chat, you know, has helped me a bunch with um, airfoil design and, and profiles and and did the mold design for the wing and things like that. But, but essentially the hands-on work is just me, um, which is daunting. <laughs> I usually don't have that, that long of an attention span, but um, I'm in the mold building phase right now. And I expect to have the molds complete this year. And I expect to have all of the raw parts of the airframe built this year. And um, you know, with any luck, maybe 2022, it'll, it'll be at Reno. Well, I look forward well, we'll to be rooting for you. Progress. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, I can't go across the street and uh, help you with the molds, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, here, let me see if I can. Um, you can look at the tail there. The tail, the tail molds are complete. Um, I really got the fuselage. I'm backwards here. The fuselage molds, which are a right and a left mold, those need to be done. But the canopy mold is done. The cowling upper and lower molds are done. Um, and the wing mold is being machined. And I believe um, Steve and I haven't talked a whole lot about it, but I think he's going to end up machining the wheel pant molds and the landing gear leg molds. So the, the most of the touch labor is getting close to being done. And if you've ever done composite work before, you know that mold making is a massive part of uh, the whole process. It's like 10 times more work to make the mold than it is to make the part. But um, once you have the molds, you can produce parts relatively quickly. Um, but yeah, Steve's absolutely right. It, it's a massive amount of work. So, but it's fun. I just um, I'm proud of myself because I've stuck with it this long. I'm if anybody knows me, um, you know, I get ribbed a lot because I have a lot of projects that I start and, and never finish. But um, for me, it's the project is the is the reward, not necessarily the finished thing all the time. You know, I like I like building things. I like doing stuff. So um, I look at it as one as entertainment. If I'll, I'll frame up an airplane and it'll sit for five years before I finish it. But I like I like building, so I framed it up and you know I got some entertainment out of that, and I learned something along the way. So, you know, it's all it's all for a greater purpose, I suppose. Well, I'm sure that once you win the Reno races, uh, you'll you'll have a lot of <laughs> orders to to put those molds to good use. Well, I don't I don't you know if it flies and I don't get hurt, that's a bonus. You know, every, everything after that is gravy. Um, 
I would lie if I didn't tell you that I didn't design the thing from the outset to be world class. And I, I am intending to make a run for the front, but I have no illusion that I'm going to be able to pull that off. That's a, a massive, massive undertaking. But well, we um, have faith that you'll do it safely. Number one, safe. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, you know, it, that's OK, but we'll uh, see. It'll be cool. There was a question in the, in the uh, comment section from Nathan. Are you going to have a test pilot do the maiden or are you going to do it? So here's here's one of those things. I don't have an ego that says I'm going to jump into my own airplane and fly it first time. I'm absolutely not. Um, I, I will be prepared when I do fly it for sure. But no, um, a gentleman by the name of Justin Phillipson, who races a shoestring called No Strings Attached, a very good friend of mine. We're very close. And he's going to do the test flying for me until the airplane is safe. Um, he's flown, um, gosh, close to a dozen different Formula One designs. And he's built two of his own. So I don't think I could really ask for a, a more qualified person to do that. Um, I don't I don't fancy myself as a test pilot. Uh, Isn't it amazing when you can put your ego in check and you know like what your limitations are and you're that's my limitation. Well, <laughs> Dying is my limitation. I don't want really to <laughs> do have those skill sets and can make the whole project better. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, they're not difficult to fly. Um, I, I'm. You know, I'm a licensed pilot and I have a tail dragger endorsement, but I have not flown anything tiny like that. Uh, so I will get, you know, an appropriate um, amount of training. There's Justin there. That's one of the planes that I work on right there. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think, honestly, um, the part of my ego that I do have is that I want Justin to come back to me and tell me that that's the best flying Formula One that he's ever been in. That that's that would be a, an ego stroke, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, who knows? Um, it shouldn't do anything crazy, but I don't know. I've never built an airplane before. <laughs> Ronnie had a great question, and uh, it was, have you built a model of the F1 to fly? I have. Um, I, I, not RC, though. Actually, it's a, a, a truck glider. <laughs> I've built that. And it's. Um, I, I do have one framed up. So there's a, a class of RC racing called Electric Formula One or EF1. And um, if you look over my shoulder here, this yellow one is an EF1 airplane. Um, I have I have an, another airplane called Endeavor um, that's very close in fuselage sort of arrangement to this one. So with a different tail and a different wing, I can I can make that work. But um, I'm not trying to build a dynamically scaled model to sort of learn anything about you know the the impulse. Um, that's a that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, in fact. NASA wrote a whole book about dynamically scaling models. So when you take a, you know, a model airplane that looks like an F-15 or whatever, the moments and the inertias and the weights don't scale uh, to a full scale directly. You know, you got to do a lot of things. So the, the model would be insanely heavy to represent, for instance, an F-15 or something like that. So, um, no, the, the aerodynamics in this particular airplane are pretty straightforward. There's nothing really... Um, crazy about it. Now, I've done some creative things with uh, staggering the pressure zones and obviously our own ideas with airfoils and things like that that I think is going to help reduce the drag and make it go faster. But um, it, it's a pretty basic airplane. And the Formula One aircraft in particular, uh, with 66 feet of square feet of wing area, really have too much wing on them. So they're kind of a they're kind of a trainer sort of. I mean, they're still they're still hot rods, but it's not like you're jumping into a fighter or something like that. So. Um, yeah, no, I have not built a, a research model. I've built a, a fun model. Well, it's just incredible that you've been able to turn something like this into something that is still so much fun and something that you can learn from and something that you can do for a job. It just, it's incredible that this has been such a big part of your life and that you've still, there's still things to, there's still things to explore with it. Well, thank you. And, you know, I can honestly say that it's all because of the passion from model airplanes. Um, you know, the reason I'm building this is because I don't know that I can't. And if you have that attitude, you know, I think you can really pretty much accomplish whatever you like. Um, yeah, I just I don't know any better. So I'm I'm going until I can't. Well, those are that's a that's a that's a great thought for the final day of the junior camp, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. That ties in perfectly. You know, we've given some foundations. We've given some building blocks. And uh, what these kids do with those, you know, is is anybody's guess. But uh, don't limit yourself. Don't let anybody limit you. Just go and do it. You know, consequences be darned. 
You know, yeah, we didn't we didn't really talk about. Up. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, we really didn't talk about it, but um, you know, I plug the NASA intern program a lot, uh, and that's because it's an opportunity that I would have killed to have, and I never I never had that. Uh, but it's important to understand that, you know, if you want something bad enough in your life, you can make it happen. Um, you know, I didn't go to college. I don't have a college degree. I'm entirely self-taught. And I never intended to end up at NASA. I, I intended to get a job so that I could buy model airplanes. And <laughs> the reason that I ended up at NASA is because all I wanted was a job so that I could buy model airplanes because it taught me everything that I needed to know to eventually end up you know, working in this career. Uh, so, you know, again, don't don't define yourself by somebody else's definition. Don't limit yourself to whatever box you think is placed around you. You can you can do anything you want. Well, thank you very much for sharing your time and sharing your stories and sharing your inspiration with us. It has been a, this has been a great conversation. I know I've learned a lot and uh, I, I certainly hope that I know that our, our viewers have been enjoying this. So and, and thank you very again, much if, for if people want to follow up with you and watch what you're doing. Watch some of these videos. What was your uh, your YouTube account? Yes. Yeah, so Red Jensen is my YouTube and we can put the link up there and, um, you know, feel free to share my personal email address. If somebody wants to get in contact, I'm happy to chat with whoever. And, uh, you know, I'd appreciate a like and subscribe. I'm trying to build the channel. Um, you know, building a full scale airplane is expensive. And so I'm, I'm building at the speed of my wallet. Uh, which is not very fast. <laughs> so, you know, eventually I'm going to have to, you know, court sponsors or, or do something, um, you know, a, a race motor, for instance, if you were to purchase an off the shelf race engine, it's 40 grand, um, you know, rolls of carbon fiber are expensive. So I'm not, I'm not begging for money. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, if you like and subscribe, that'll help me get there someday. So yeah. Uh, until then I just keep, keep plugging away. Well, in the meantime, it's great entertainment to watch, to see you figure these things out, uh, to uh, see your inspiration converted into something physical and real, and uh, that's going to knock the socks off everybody. That's really cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and you know, I've sort of gravitated to folks that share that same passion as I do. And, um, you know, when you find somebody that that kind of what I call gets it, you know, once they sort of understand, you, you form lifelong friendships. Um, and you know, that thirst, that, again, that thirst for knowledge is what is what drives me. So uh, that's what keeps me going. Cool. And I'm going to jump in really quickly, too, and say you offered to share your personal email address, which for the people that are watching, that's huge. You know, this guy is amazing. He's got such a wealth of knowledge and information and experience. Um, you know, uh, feel free to jump in. And there it is right there. Um, don't don't flood his account. But uh, you know, if you've got a question, feel free to jump <laughs> Go ahead. In. I don't mind. That's all right. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me. And, um, you know, I hope someday this is the second time we've done this virtually. But, uh, you know, someday if this ever happens again in person, I would love to come out there and, and hang out and, and fly with some folks. That would be nothing better. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think Camp 2021 in person here at the Academy of Model Aeronautics is going to be a go this year. Put, so uh, hopefully put me we'll on the list. There. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I definitely love to support that. Cool. Well, you heard it I would love to have an, another chance to talk to you some more about all this and uh, would absolutely uh, would love that opportunity. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for the questions. I'm going to go back through the chat and uh, read some of them. I, I've caught a few of them, but not too many. Uh, I want to say a quick hi to my buddy, John Barnes, up in Northern California. He's an old RC buddy of mine. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for joining. You bet. All well, right. thank this you has been us. awesome for us. Thank you so much for joining us, Red. And as we close down our camp, uh, virtual AMA Junior Camp for 2021, uh, couldn't ask for a better, uh, better commentary, better conversation. Um, you know, this is this is a weird part. You know, where we're closing it down and, and saying goodbye for the this week. But the good thing is, is these will live on. Uh, this will be packaged as an on-demand camp. Uh, and you can watch this interview as well as all the other great interviews we've had. You can see Kyle teaching all these great lessons and uh, me happily joining along and having fun with y'all. And uh, it's going to be wonderful to uh, pursue this uh, at your pace moving forward. Uh, there's a few thank yous. I'd like to jump in really quickly and say uh, thanks to everyone on staff here at the Academy of Model Aeronautics. 
uh, for, for making this possible. You know, we couldn't do this as a small education team. It really takes the whole uh, organization to support these things. And so my hat's off to everyone who jumped in and stamp boxes, packed kits, um, helped us out when it, when it came to uh, editing, uh, when it came to getting videography done, B-roll, all that stuff, and even the production and behind the scenes. Like, um, you know, you see these great videos and images coming up to coincide with what we're talking about. That's all the editing staff back there. You know, the production staff is really knocking it out of the park. So thanks to them. Um, and thanks to Executive Council for supporting us, Chad Boudreau, and also the Legacy Society member, Don McWhorter, and uh, his family uh, donated to uh, ensure that Camp AMA, Junior Camp AMA, uh, went forward this year and uh, for years to come. We greatly appreciate that support. We couldn't do it without it. And uh, thanks to everyone who's watching that's a camper. Uh, that has enjoyed this process with us. Uh, and, and thanks also to the educators, the teachers, the parents, <laughs> the adults uh, who have equipped these kids to really uh, learn and have fun. So I'll, I'll leave it off with Kyle for now. All right. And I want to echo Kyle Jay's thanks to all the people that helped make this a make this a very special occasion, uh, make this a very special week for everybody. Thank you for tuning in every day and uh, following along with our projects and um, asking great questions of our speakers. And just remember that this is only the beginning of an aero modeling journey that could potentially last a lifetime. So keep learning, keep experimenting, keep uh, keep working with your models, keep learning more about what you can build and what you can learn. Um, and uh, remember that these videos that we've been making all week, the speaker series videos are available to stream at the same link that we you received in your email immediately. Those are available right now. And the project videos that we've been working on in the mornings will be made publicly available starting next week. So keep an eye out for those links, share them if you want. Um, the more people who can get involved with everything that we've been talking about this week, the better. So um, thank you for being a part of it. And uh, we certainly hope that uh, this is not the end of your model aviation journey. Yeah, and there's plenty of resources on uh, amaflightschool.org. You can check out quick projects. You can check out last year's camp. Jump into that. Enjoy it. Uh, you can find out about model aviation by going to modelaircraft.org um, or modelaviation.com uh, and really learn about this hobby. Learn about the great opportunities that exist. Uh, you can become a member today if you're so interested. Uh, we also have free programming available for educators. Don't miss any of that. That's at flightschool.org. And, uh, you know, however we can support uh, model aviation and the passion of aviation, we're excited to do so. Feel free to reach us at education at modelaircraft.org. Uh, that'll go to the whole team here. And uh, we look forward to helping out uh, and making sure that you're facili facilitated uh, to uh, conduct these kinds of lessons. All right. Well, we'll see y'all later. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you at either in-person camp or AMA Junior Camp next year. Can't wait. Right. Looking forward to it. It'll be fun. Happy flying.